Now, there's some intriguing data that is emergent, let's say, um, that suggests that it may be that you have an increased probability of being infected as you move around in the environment if you have been vaccinated with one jab, one dose of vaccine, genetic vaccine. And if you have two doses of vaccine, you have an even higher risk, so we call this negative effectiveness, of being infected by Omicron. And if you have three doses of vaccine, remember the Israelis are now going to four, if you have three doses, so you have the booster, you have an even higher risk of being infected by Omicron than somebody that did not receive vaccine or received one dose of vaccine or received two doses of vaccine. So your risk of infection on average appears in some data sets from national governments to be highest if you've received three doses with Omicron. This is worrisome because it suggests that there are aspects of Omicron that may be being enhanced by something that is associated with vaccination. And there's a bunch of different hypotheses. Don't go straight to antibody dependent enhancement. That is one of many different ways. And here's a trivial. Um, as you receive more vaccine, it may change your behavior. If you're a European young person, you may be more likely to go clubbing if you've had two jabs than if you have three jabs, maybe three jabs, you're even more likely to go clubbing and exist in these large intense groups that are perfect breeding factories for infection. So I use that as a trivial example that we can't jump to conclusions about the mechanisms, but the data seem to be there. And I'm hearing from multiple patients anecdotally, you know, in New Year's Eve parties or Christmas parties or other social gatherings where inadvertently most people are jabbed maybe one or two has not taken vaccine and somebody comes into that environment that's infected. I'm hearing anecdotally that the people that are previously vaccinated are often become infected and symptomatic much sooner and at a much higher rate than those that were not previously um, vaccinated. Here's the rub with all of that is Looking at the CDC data, they've stopped reporting the incidence, the prevalence, I should say, of having been infected in the United States. They stopped reporting it at about 45 percent a couple months ago. But if you look at the trend curves, there's a good chance that about 70 percent of the entire population in the United States has been infected with some version of SARS-CoV-2, which means that they've developed natural immunity. So when we talk about the difference between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, we have to recognize that there's a bunch of subgroups within that. And um, we have those that are probably naturally immune, but not vaccinated. We have naturally immune that have received vaccine. And we have ones that have not encountered the virus before, but have been vaccinated. So it's complicated right now. We don't have clean data, but in general, the good news is that Omicron is much, much less pathogenic, even though it's much more highly infectious. And I went out on a limb about this as the South African data was coming in before Christmas. And, you know, it's on Laura Ingram. Uh, I spoke about it. I wrote about it in my Substack that it looked to me like Omicron was something like a gift. Uh, whether you believe in a divine entity or whatever, um, Omicron looked to me like a lot like what if I was given the task of what would be the optimal characteristics of an infectious live attenuated vaccine virus, what would that look like? What would be its characteristics? It would infect the nasopharynx and the upper respiratory tract. It would spread freely in the population. It would generate a strong T cell response and mucosal immune response. And people afterwards would not have major symptoms, would not die from it. It would be attenuated. Uh, but they would develop 
natural immunity after having recovered from the infection. And I spoke about this at a time when this was heresy. All of the broadcast uh, media was focusing everybody on the fear of Omicron. But the data are out. Um, they are increasingly strong. As, as Laura Ingram quoted the other day when I was on her show, 300% increase in a virus infection with Omicron and a 3% decrease in hospitalizations. You got to keep in mind if a lot more people are getting infected at the same time, and this will move through the entire population, whether you're wearing masks or not masks, unless you live on top of a mountain and nobody talks to you ever. Um, that's just what's going to happen. It is that insanely infectious. Whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, it may be that natural infection provides more protection than the vaccine does, but the majority of America will be infected by Omicron and they will develop natural immunity. And if we're lucky, we will get to a point where we finally do reach something like herd immunity and this virus just becomes another indigenous coronavirus in the population like the currently circulating beta coronaviruses that we call the common cold. So, you know, herd immunity, this is another concept that's kind of been weaponized, you know, in, <laughs> in the media, okay, certainly in some, among people, but, you know, herd immunity is something that is just going to happen with anything, right? Assuming that humanity survives. Hopefully. Um, <laughs> or it won't. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe the virus keeps evolving. Because um, this one okay. evolves really fast, but let's hope it does. Mm -hmm. We do develop herd immunity or something akin to it. But the vaccines, the genetic vaccines, uh, don't contribute to the herd immunity, or do they? I wouldn't. I wouldn't phrase it that way. Um, when you say won't contribute, that's an absolute statement, and none of this is absolute. So just to loop back a little bit about herd immunity. Herd immunity is not a binary thing. We've reached it or we haven't reached it. Okay? It's, there's, there's, there's those, there are those, there's a school of thought that the characteristic of the modern educated mind is a comprehension of calculus. Calculus is a metaphor. What we have is an asymptote, a limit line, which is that the reproductive coefficient falls below one. What is herd immunity? It is a time in which if I happen to be infected, the probability that I will infect anybody else is less than one. This is like thinking about a thermonuclear reaction, a chain reaction. You quench the th chain reaction by putting the carbon rods in there because they absorb the uh, neutrons, typically. Um, and so they can no longer participate in a chain reaction in an eventual explosion. That's how nuclear energy is tamed. Likewise with viruses. When we reach a point where the probability when I'm infected that I infect less than one other person, the virus will be quenched. It will no longer spread in the population. That doesn't mean that everyone will be perfectly protected. It means it won't be spreading in the population anymore. And you don't, that's not a binary number. If we hit 70%, the flaw here was that our public health officials made these grossly naive statements about if we hit this milestone of vaccine uptake, we will reach herd immunity. If we hit this milestone, that was just horrible, ignorant messaging. And it reflects the fact that those people that are making those statements, and you know who I'm speaking about, are not actually trained in epidemiology. And yet they put out this messaging about, well, if we only reach this milestone, we will hit herd immunity or that milestone. And they kept, it kept creeping up because we weren't hitting herd immunity. And the fault is that they should have never made those statements in the first place. Herd immunity is a really complicated variable. And like I said, if you think of a limit line, that is that the reproductive coefficient falls below one, herd immunity is approached on a curve that approaches that as an asymptote. For those that are, are understanding calculus, that's what it is. That's how it works. 